recording started. Yes. So we'll. Um, this is a, a really nice session to be having today. We've been chatting prior to this actual conversation for quite some time, so we've still got more to talk about. But this this session today is really about the value and importance of leadership, uh, and it can be just in the grassroots leadership, or it can be the leadership at a much higher level, at ministerial level. And we're very fortunate today to have Professor Stephen Heppel with us at a very early morning hour um, who will be talking to us a little bit more uh, later about how he deals and encourages leaders to work in a range of areas around education internationally so that Stephen thanks so much for being a part of this conversation today at 3 45 4 o'clock in the morning at your time so thank you there is a couple of things we'd just like to point out. Please, uh, if you could just have your microphone muted, uh, you'll see that on the bottom bar on the left. And there's a chat section there you'll see in the middle. If you, if, if you are here now, I'd be able to just introduce yourself in the sense of where you're from. Um, that would be really helpful for us just to know how far our reach is. This will be recorded and you'll be able to see it on the YouTube channel for Caesar, which there'll be a link to later. Um, the host will be able to indicate the channel for the videos being off, which is good to have them off at the moment because of the cyber safety we're having for this particular video and session. And if you wish to do any non-verbal reactions, there's a little button at the bottom for that too. So in Tasmania, uh, which we call Rutruwita, I'd just like to acknowledge the Aboriginal people, the Lassi and Waterways, and acknowledge the deep respect that the traditional owners of this land, which is the Muanina people. And I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. The session we're going to run today, I'm going to have a brief introduction around the local situation here in Tasmania. Stephen has a broader view of the Australian connections that he's had over many, many years of visiting Australia and Tasmania. And Stephen's from the UCJC in, as a professor in Madrid, and I'll get Stephen to describe a little bit more of his role later on. So thanks, Stephen. And my role today is really just to give a bit of a, a look at three case studies. I have a role with the Caesar MOOC project team, and I'm fortunate enough to have a role with ACARA, the Australian Curriculum and Reporting Authority, working with 12 schools on a continuous basis. So we're going to look at some of those schools, but, but in general, the Caesar schools are part of that same community. We're going to look at an island community, it's the Flinders Island and King Island to some respects, a remote western coast schools, a cluster of four, and an urban school in Hobart, Tasmania. And Stephen's going to give us a global perspective after my little session. Just to remind all of you too, those of you who are here would have been very much aware of the Computer Science Education Research Project or the MOOCs, massive open online courses that have been running now for three to four years nationally, with well over 35,000 teachers having engaged in some form of professional learning in that period of time. Just like to let a lot of you also know that there are now some new books that have been produced, and that even though um, you may have dipped out of them and not come back in, you'll see that there's some cyber safety, cyber security and cyber awareness MOOCs available, which are excellent for primary and secondary, and some very, very good ones now on. Um, AI, AR, and VR. So the case studies. <clears throat> Flinders Island, this is really for those of you who are outside of Tasmania. Um, Stephen knows this area very well, having visited us on many occasions. But the island schools of Flinders Island, uh, a school of about uh, a community of 700 people, broken up into three little islands. Over here we have King Island. So I'll be looking at Flinders Island briefly. Also looking at the West Coast area around Queenstown, Straw and Rosebury and Zeehan, remote communities in the World Heritage Area or just outside of the World Heritage Area and a local urban school in Taruna, which is doing whole of school project work. So how does Flinders Island community and why have, we so, so why have I selected this to talk about? Flinders Island was selected by the Department of Education to be a, an ongoing survey of schools, 140 nationally, 
to see what happened in a community where principals changed, teachers changed regularly, they were remote, they were isolated, they had an Indigenous population, maybe a low Xeos score, low SES uh, classification. So Flinders is certainly classified as a remote and regional school, uh, one of our more remote schools and half hour flight from Launceston. And it also has a, an unfortunate Indigenous education, hist uh, Indigenous history, um, which is not to be talked about at the stage, but it's certainly a, an area it's had, had in the past, but it's an isolated school community. There are about 100, 120 students in the school, uh, goes from K to 12. And the leadership in that school worked with a, a, a particularly enthusiastic teacher to take up digital technologies as the Australian curriculum requested. That particular teacher then went off and did a grad cert in digital technologies with another 20 teachers from around Tasmania to give her some extra experience and then was supported by the principal when she came back to actually then become a lead teacher in the school. So that, that role of having the support of an enthusiastic teacher supported by an engaged principal has seen that school now develop a range of projects. They've had a number of their pieces of work published on the DT Hub, which is the Digital Technologies Hub in Australia, which is, a, she has, a, if you look up Cindy Thornton, you'll find her work on the DT Hub. And the principal has given her as much support as he possibly can to attend professional learning projects and uh, attend anything that she can online and elsewhere to give her the experience. She's trying very hard to build capacity within the remainder of her staff, but there is some problems with uh, release time for teachers. So she does tend to end up doing the lessons on her own while teachers try to make up the time in other areas, but they are working towards that. But that's that's been a very interesting school to visit. and. Each time we visit the school, as, or I visit the school as an education officer, you can see that they are looking a little bit further ahead to see what else they might produce. And over the three years, from being somewhat tentative, they're now at the point where they're very confident about how they can produce digital technologies or present it to their children. They're one of 12 schools that are engaged in the ACARA project for digital technologies and focus, but they've been very much involved in using the CESA MOOC lending library, having borrowed every term a different lending library. At the moment, they're now using something around VR and VR to create an online tour uh, of the island. So multiple visits has helped that school and it's given them the confidence with their teacher to have the support from their principal. The West Coast schools are quite different. What happened there was, there were two schools selected, Rosebury and Zeehan, and this has been a principal-led program. Principal-led in the sense that both the principals realised that for their children in those ISO schools of Zeehan, Rosebury, Queenstown and Strawn, they didn't want them to leave the district. They wanted them to take up positions within their local community. And when the mining industry and the fisheries industry came to them and said, look, we want children to come to us, but we don't want them to come with picks and shovels and fishing lines. We want them to come with digital technology skills because industries are very, very much technology based. So they picked up the cudgels with that. They applied for Apple's Plus grant, which gave them $60,000. And they put that towards buying resources and uh, providing professional learning. So four schools have clustered together, principal led, for example, at the Zian school, every teacher, and there's a lot of change of staff in the schools, has to do the CESA MOOC. It's just part of the ongoing process for teachers who come to that school. They're new, they're young, they're enthusiastic, but the principal says you will need to do the MOOC because we are a digital technology school. They've also allowed, uh, engaged in having the CSRHS grant. So they were a recipient of some funding for that. Uh, computer science for health, uh, education for high schools and for primary. And those particular events have allowed us to invite people such as Stephen, not in this particular one, but in early years has come to these events, as has the Australian Computing Academy, members of um, some CESA groups, uh, attendees and elsewhere uh, in the Digital Technologies Hub. 
So I encouraged uh, other schools to apply for these sorts of grants as well. So this was a, a principal led discussion and a principal led um, blossoming really of digital technologies on, on West Coast remote school. They engaged in several borrowings of the CESA MOOCs, which has been very helpful to them. And two of those schools are part of the ACARA DTIF initiative as well. The third school uh, that we would look at is one in Taruna. The link will be put on the chat. Uh, Taruna has uh, a very interesting story to tell. They also received a digital literacy grant, one of the grants that were applied for by schools three years ago. And they put that funding to, res to allowing the lead teacher in the school, the deputy principal, to take six to eight mentors, train them up through the season MOOC. So every teacher in that group who volunteered to be a part of the team became mentors following the completion of the two season MOOCs in F to six and the F to six extended. They then took on the responsibility of looking after one to two other teachers in the school. The principals fully supported this. They gave them time release to do the projects and they took those, those teachers aside and they trained them fully so they could then become mentors to others. That school's got a whole of school approach now to digital technologies. And Hilary Purdy, who's the deputy principal at the school, has now taken on the role of doing uh, some webinars and she'll be doing one for the ACARA DTIF program on Wednesday next week, talking about the whole school program. And we could put a link up for that a little later. So, that project has been extraordinarily successful where the conversation in the staff room was around digital technologies and it was driven by the fact that the whole school was engaged in the conversation, not in the case of, for instance, Flinders, where it was teacher led by one teacher or cluster led by two or four principals in the West Coast. This is actually a whole school from the bottom up, all engaged in conversations around digital technologies. And it's been particularly successful. Although Hillary will be talking, she said on Wednesday, a bit about how the design and technologies aspect of the digital technologies curriculum really supported her in getting more teachers engaged in the process. The final thing I really want to talk about, <clears throat> because after all, I, we're all teachers, I'm a teacher and have been a teacher for 40 years, is we, the teacher is a leader. You don't have to look for a leader sometimes, you can be the leader because remember, a lot of our leaders were teachers too. So I encourage any of us really to go out and seek support from colleagues to whom or with whom to collaborate. Um, sometimes being an island is lonely, um, even if we're on Tasmania. And it is very, very good if you can go out and seek others to collaborate with. And that may involve, for example, joining a professional organization. Uh, TASITE is the one for Tasmania, the education group. Um, Contact your curriculum leaders in your jurisdiction. Many of them are in offices and they do not necessarily have the capacity to contact you as a teacher. And they're, from my experience, very, very keen to have teachers contact them. It gives them legitimacy for their role. And they would love to come and see schools. From my discussions, all those jurisdictional heads who are in this particular curriculum area are looking to get into schools to work with you. Apply for grants, um, they come up regularly. Look on the, computer, the Commonwealth Government website for grant applications. There've been a number of them in recent years. Don't be afraid to apply um, because there is funding around or has been significant funding around to support this curriculum area. Reach out to professionals outside of education. For instance, the West Coast schools were looking at the professionalism of the fishermen and the miners in their community to come back and give the children um, aspects of support that they wouldn't have otherwise known about that industry. Um, there's the STEM professionals as well in CSRO. Enter your students in local, national, international challenges. I always encourage you to do that because it gives them a chance to actually meet community leaders and schools outside of their own jurisdiction, their own town, their own small school community. It's the way we met Stephen. 20 odd years ago, Stephen, I think it was. And make contact with national and international leaders, just as I said, with Stephen, others, because they're generous to a fault. Stephen's up at 2.30, 3.30 in the morning, looking bright eyed and bushy tailed, and um, has been chatting with us for an hour before all this started. And this is a very, very timely chance now to introduce Stephen. And 
we can, we're just going to have a sort of open conversation with Stephen. Uh, Stephen's going to talk about the things that he's been doing. It's always engaging. So welcome, Stephen. Um, I've, I've got a link here, which goes to Stephen's webpage, which is heppel.net, um, where you'll see a great deal of information in the projects he's been involved with for many, many years. He's worked here with us in Tasmania on several occasions. He, I know he visits South Australia and works with the Mark Oliphant School, Western Australia, Victoria, New South Wales. You may well have already seen and spoken to Stephen before. He's currently the professor of the Philippe Segovia Chair of Learning in Madrid. And he's been doing that from 2011, along with other professor professorial roles he has had and we asked Stephen very kindly if he might talk, give us a bit of a global perspective on leadership and education before and after COVID and how we might see education in the future. And so Stephen, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, we can come back to this little uh, slide that I have here at the end and um, I'll pass this over to you. Yeah, thanks Pete. And um, yeah, good, good morning. <laughs> uh, and if you're watching this, it probably would be good for you to be on speaker view because I'm going to use the background in my in my little window to um, to illustrate some of the things we're talking about. Um, it's just probably before we start or in starting, it's worth getting our heads around the scale of some of all this. And then Pete was kind enough to mention my dear old Hebel.net website, but um, 25 million people went to that website, 25 million unique identities went to that website last year. It's incredible numbers, really. Um, and then there, not very many of them are ministers, let me tell you. I've, uh, I've talked to a lot of education ministers in the last six months, 103 to be precise, which is, I don't have a collective noun for a muddle, a muddle of ministers would be probably fair. But it's interesting to, to think that of that they're in charge of a lot of children, 2.2 billion children in the world. Not many of those in England, even not many of those in Australia, hell of a lot of those in the Philippines and India and China and goodness knows where. And of those 2.2 billion children, about half and not having much of an experience of learning at all. They're, they've got a bit of primary something. Um, for some of them, there's nothing at all. There's, um, we're, we're doing some work with the um, Pakistan um, education at the moment, and there's 25 million children, 25 million children not in education at all. There's no school, no nothing. They're kind of sitting sitting down waiting for education to arrive. And even if it, even if there was the money to give them schools, the reality is that we're not going to find a million teachers for those 25 million kids, are we? So um, this is a very interesting time to be looking at, at education. And it's probably that there's an assembly in reflecting to your children that we're in sort of 75 year cycles in all this. So in, uh, in Europe, for sure, we around about 1800, it was Bible stories we had sunday schools the churches would bring kids in on a sunday and you know try to give them some of the stories from the bible and when i look around the world at other cultures and other religions around about that sort of that moment you know the the sense of mass literacy would be sharing a common narrative was quite quite um, prevalent by the time we get to 1870 uh, in england it was about 18 60s in Australia on the back of the gold rush, um, really, if you're up in Queensland. Um, there was a sudden need for kids to have more than just, you know, one shared set of stories from the Bible. They were, we wanted kids who could tell the time, do a bit of maths, and, and have some basic literacy. So 1870 Act in, in the UK, and very much similar timing around the world because it was on the back of the Industrial Revolution as well, um, compulsory primary education sprung up for us. And it's kind of interesting, by the way, the, the, who were the teachers in compulsory primary education? Largely the children. Uh, you know, you, you had pupil teachers in Australia, you got the 13 and you were plugged straight back into the system as a teacher. 
and that was that stayed in place in the certainly in the Caribbean until the 1950s you know so um, you know compulsory primary education quite a lot of it was by children for children the children became the leaders of learning and then Second World War, which pretty much was a world war, I mean, affected everywhere, really. Um, maybe not Switzerland, but everywhere else, you know. Um, you know, along came the Second World War. And during the war, our children in England were evacuated from the centres that were being bombed. My, my PhD student, Stan Owers, uh, who was a, 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 lo a lovely student, he was evacuated for three years, taken from his home, sent off to work on a a Welsh farm, and had the most torrid time. I mean, he was, you know, he was slave labour on the farm almost, you know, didn't have much education there. And then and then came back, had to wear a gas mask, you know, all, you know, doing drills and alerts. And then, you know, we think 16 weeks of lockdown in South Australia is a long time. Imagine what three years away from home felt like. And then they all came back. And curiously, you know, on the back of that, we we built a generation of, of ingenuity, really, a lot of the, a lot of the growth in in England, in particular, was on the, on the back of the children who'd survived all that, the Colin Chapmans and the Vivian Westwoods and the, and so on. You know, they 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 managed to solve problems on a daily basis, and when the world returned to normal, we kept them going on all that. But the the feeling during the war was that that. There was a huge disparity between kids. Kids had been evacuated from the East End out into leafier parts of the of the country. And people were shocked at the gap between what they thought children knew and what children actually knew. And there was a sense of entitlement as much as a sense of economic need. I mean, the you know, the initial thing was economic need, and sort of sense of entitlement. And we had an 18, we had a 1944 Education Act which, by the way, gave the keys to education to teachers and head teachers. The view was that the teachers would write the curriculum and develop the exams and do all the other things. And, um, you yeah, know, that was, that was compulsory secondary education started at that point for us and changed everything, really. Well, just do the maths on all that. There's 75 years between... Sunday schools and compulsory primary education. It's 75 years between compulsory primary education and compulsory secondary education. It's 75 years between compulsory secondary education and now. So the question is, you know, is this a, you know, is this a 75 year cycle? Uh, is COVID big enough to be a huge fork in the road that takes us off in another direction? And it is, it absolutely is. I mean, interestingly, talking to those 103 ministers and their senior civil servants, about three quarters of them are saying, it's gonna be different. Things are gonna change, they're gonna change really fast. And what that change looks like, we'll come to in a minute, but I've never known a time when leadership was more important um, than now. And I've never known a more exciting time. And I'm. I'm getting on a bit now, you know, but this is the best decade of our lives ahead of us now. Uh, just extraordinary times. And I'm going to illustrate that a little bit um, as we work through this. But I mean, it wasn't so long ago. Gosh, I'm trying to remember when, but it must have been around about the turn of the millennium. I had a phone call from Downing Street it was the, the prime minister's office on the phone, you know. And they said, oh, we're, we're going to build a college for leadership. We get that. We're going to have a college to lead, you know, for all our head teachers. And I was like, oh, um, yeah, well, well done. Carry on, you know. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. The, um, the college is going to take a bit of time to build. Uh, and we wondered, this is a great, if ever I wrote an autobiography, I think I'd use this as a title. They said, we wonder if you might build something virtual in the meantime, you know. <laughs> I think sort of something virtual in the meantime is probably the story of our lives, really. But I said, well, OK, we can uh, we can design you an online leadership community for head teachers. Of course. Well, I said, give us a month. We'll come back with proper costings and all those sort of things. They said, no, no, no. You don't understand. And I, you know, Downing Street always say you don't understand. So 
well, tell me more. They said the Prime Minister is speaking on Thursday. This conversation was Tuesday lunchtime. And um, they said, we need to have something in the press banks for Wednesday. So I said, okay, right, well, we'll design it in 24 hours then. We can do that, you know. So we didn't go to bed. We kind of up all night and put together this, film, which was talking heads, you know, 23,000 head teachers online, which was fabulous. So you go, go to my website, you'll see the history of all that and some of the some of the many details. But one of the things that was really interesting about Talking Heads was the quality of the discourse in there. And I think my one regret about it really was that it wasn't global. We had a, we had a Welsh Talking Heads and we had a Scottish Talking Heads called Heads Together. Couldn't use the same name. Um, but Talking Heads should have been a global thing for sure because as I look around the world, we, we all learn from each other in spectacular ways. And uh, I think what I've learned most in all this is that with 2.2 billion children, if we don't harness them to be leaders of learning, we have got no chance. Uh, there, there's too much change to manage, there's too much to do. Uh, and they know more about some things than we do, but we know you know, we're the learning professionals in the room. And I'm going to give you some examples of what happens when we unleash children as leaders of learning on all this. And um, I can kind of start with this rather nice sign in, in, in Madrid. I'll just duck down here a bit for a minute, you know, and out of the way. But, you know, this is, um, this is a group of children in Madrid that we asked to, to, to remodel their own learning. We said, just make over the the learning that you're doing. And you can see the sign here that sort of says, by children for children. And it also says, um, in English and in Spanish, the kids were very conscious of the fact that it was, there was, a, there was an audience looking at them. And some of the things they did were, were, were pretty remarkable at the time. I think I've got, um, maybe I've got an image or two of that that uh, might, I might share with you, but, um, here we go. So this was this was one of the spaces, um, and the first thing we did was to ask them to to rebuild the space in cardboard. Really, but they said, "What budget have you got?" We said, "No, we got no money at all." The um, you can see the head teacher Phil standing there. By the way, I'm I'm over here by the screen, and you'll notice that the screen is cardboard. So uh, they built a new space with a cardboard interactive whiteboard and they had 10 iPads in the room eight of them were cardboard two of them worked they had a there's a sort of three-sided space over here you can just about if you're on speaker view you'll be able to see this pretty clearly the it's like chicken wire and brown paper a little cave they could sit in you know and uh, you know this curtain which was you know was supposed to sort of go across to divide up the space so they could do zonal teaching and you know, run a carousel of learning activities. There isn't enough cloth. You can never draw the curtain. So they had to imagine the curtain was drawn. They had to imagine the screen was working. But to our surprise, the learning got better any which way we measured it. And, you know, their, their, their attendance was better. They arrived earlier. Their attainment was higher. Their collaboration, if you did a discourse analysis of their um, text-based language they said we and our more than me and my you know any which way you measured the learning it got better we were a bit gobsmacked you know how can how can learning be better when it's cardboard you know and of course what was happening was they were role-playing future learning they were saying well let's imagine this is in the future let's imagine we're we're learning in you know 2025 or 2020 i think would have been the future when we did all this and kids, kids love to role play. And it turned out the role playing education was role playing future education was better than the education they were getting at the time, which was pretty good anyway, you know. So then we took those kids and we said, um, after they'd been in their room for, we said, come to the university and we've, we've got this old warehouse. We want you to try and imagine that you're leading learning in the university and you want to build a new space, can you build us a new space in cardboard? 
And yes, of course they could. I don't know, you can't see there, but there's a sign hanging up about there that says glass wall. They had a bit of wire, you know, and a sign on that said glass wall. Here's a glass wall, there's no wall. Here. And uh, we said, well, you build it and we'll build it. So we built their room. So that was, that was the room they built in cardboard. There's our version of it. Um, and we exactly followed, you know, what they'd, what they designed, which was, you know, it was pretty seductive. And I love this image, which I'll, I'll just dip down again here because this is a professional development session. And you can see here, you know, staff from around the university and some students, but look down here at who's leading, look who's leading the seminar. These are kids. And the kids are saying, yeah, look, this is how a hardness table works. This is what you're seeing here is a Skype bar. So they had the habit in their classroom of Skyping to other schools and saying, hey, what are you guys doing? And, you know, it's a Skype bar and they, they, needed, they needed their teachers to understand. They needed them to understand this, you know, that when you're, you know, when you're, when you're working remotely with people, you know, there are folk that you're working on the, on the same line of latitude and, you know, you, you set a task and you pass it around the world and it goes, well, for you, it'd sort of go off to, um, where would you go? You go up to South America and then sort of back around the Pacific and come back in through um, whatever. Or did you go to South Africa, perhaps on the way, Johannesburg? I don't know. But, or you can say who's on our line of longitude. And then for you, you know, it goes all the way up through China, Siberia, um, you know, the various poles and so on. And they were trying to explain to their teachers, you know, that, that there's, a, there's a difference between Skyping to people that, you know, like me up in the middle of the night um, and not had breakfast yet and Skyping to people like you, you know, are scattered around the large continent, but on, you know, Western time zones and some of you in Canberra, some of you in, um, on the Swan River down there on the other end, you know. Stephen, so, yeah. I just got to ask, that, that required some faith and trust in the teachers, the adults in the room, didn't it? That, that's yeah. a different sort of leadership, isn't it? That's the leadership that allows children to be leaders because those teachers and leaders could have said, no, we don't want to listen to what you have to say. So that, that's, a, a, that's a leap for some adults. Yes, it was. I mean, it's, um, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of teachers, as everybody knows. You know, I've used to be one for long enough, you know, and um, I think they've been incredibly... Uh, ingenious actually during the COVID thing but you kind of see what's happening in COVID starkly and that's why I think it's a 75 year change because I haven't necessarily seen that faith from ministers I haven't seen your ministers or our ministers saying you know what we don't know where this is all going let's trust the kids they haven't even said we don't know where this is going let's trust the head teachers but what I have seen and um you know, you've got that lovely um, conversation website in uh, in Australia. If you look at the current conversation, they're looking at the, you know, the the changes in online learning that are going on. And of course, the big, you know, the, the online learning has been, it's like a fork in the road in itself. You know, some schools have said, okay, let's, let's build an analogue of what we were doing before. Well, you know, we've got it right. We don't want to listen to anybody. You know, we'll have online lessons. So if it's 11 o'clock in the morning, you need to be sat at your desk at home and it's RE with Mr. Smith, you know. And of course, that was never going to work for a mass of reasons. Um, you know, firstly, Mr. Smith, you know, is, is, is not the best performer on an online screen. You know, it's a tough thing to be engaging. Look, I'm struggling to be engaging. You know, it's a tough thing to be engaging at this time of the morning let alone, you know, um, but also, you know, if I'm a kid and I've got to be online at 11 and I've got two siblings, you know, and my older brother's got a physics lesson and my younger sister's got a PE lesson, we're all going to be online and mum is trying to hold down a zero hours contract and she's got to be online to try and grab work. So there's four of us fighting for precious bandwidth and the, the MBN and quite got through to you yet, you know. Uh, it's not going to work. And we saw that schools that tried to just replicate synchronous learning, huge problems with um, equity and engagement. They, you know, they lost a lot of families and they lost a lot of kids. Wealthy schools, not so much. 
but most schools, yeah, lost a lot. So, you know, we've known for 30 years or so that online learning works when you have, you know, longer, more project-based things with little touch points. You can go, go to hebel.net slash LOL, learning online. You'll see the whole list of things that we've, 30 years of, of summary, hebel.net slash LOL. Um, we've known all that. And what we've seen from it is remarkable and rapid progress. So the stars really of the stars of the COVID online era have been Zoom, I mean, clearly, um, TikTok, and kids are doing a huge amount of good learning in TikTok and little micro lessons and, you know, kind of woke teachers are doing, you know, assemblies like 30 seconds, here's why we're a team, let's get together, you know. Not, you know, not, not quite doing your kind of crazy TikTok dances, but, you know, but actually using the 60 second video and the ease of, the ease of public, publishing, you know, to do some really good stuff. Stephen, I'm just going to ask you another question there. Yeah, um, yeah. Some questions are coming through from the audience as well. Um, one of the questions is that they love the idea of, um, sorry, no, not that one. Where was I going? It keeps moving up. Well, there's one here. Question. There's one here that says, "We love the we love the design and the cardboard thing." How did they? Where did that's the design the come from? How did yep, they do it? So, that's a really good question. And and the key distinction here is. You're never asking the children for their opinions, and if you do that, you just—it's just a gossip at the bus stop. You know, your your leaders, your head teachers, your teachers—you're asking the kids for their research. We're saying to them, you know, see what the others are doing, see what ideas work. Let me let me give you two or three examples of what that can look like. Here's a here's a school in uh, in Islington in um, in in London, and this is um, you know pre-COVID, so. They, they, like a lot of schools, they're struggling to manage um, noise levels. And they what they've done to make all that work uh, elegantly is uh, they put a little digital meter in the, in the room. You can see it here. It's an old tablet. It's running a decibel meter. And those, these two guys are in charge of sound. They're the, they're the noise monitors for the day. And so if the sound goes up too high, then they'll come around and have a quiet word with you and shut you down. Not a teacher's job to manage noise, it's the kids manage it themselves. And I love that when, when the kids in Bondi Beach Primary School, where I happen to be doing some work in New South Wales, when they saw this, they said, oh yeah, we could, we could use that too. We could, um, our noisiest room, they'd surveyed the school, our noisiest room is the dining hall, which was deafening, you know, um, thermoplastic tile floors, hard surfaces on the desk, glass down both sides, no concrete ceiling. You could, you know, you could not build a louder echo chamber if you tried. They've been quoted some ludicrous amount of money by architects to put in, you know, acoustic modeling and blah, blah, blah. And so what they did was they, they put a sign up in the canteen and they put a decibel meter up. You know, they borrowed the idea from Hargrave Park School in Islington and they found that um, people paid attention because the sign said, if the noise goes up above 80 decibels, which is quite loud, the price of custard is gonna double. Actually, the price of everything is gonna double. So, you know, if you want your lunch to be affordable, you better keep it down. And the minute those, those, those hands went up to turn, the, to turn the price list from normal to noisy, the sound just dropped. I mean, it turns out kids were comfortably in charge of their own sound. And when we start, when we start sort of throwing this stuff at, at details, here's another one. So this was, this is in um, Dubai. And in Dubai, we'd been measuring the CO2. I'm gonna show you some levels first before we go to the, we'd been measuring the levels of CO2. We'd found that CO2 in the classroom, you know, kids were coming in in the morning, breathing, CO2 was going up to we go out at break with the CO2 is heavy, it doesn't go out, the CO2 goes up to a peak at lunchtime, the kids go out for lunch, they come back, the windows are open, but the CO2 is ponded into the room. The yellow line here is the line 1,000 parts per million, but which your brain, above that, your brain functions suboptimally. You know, the minute the CO2 is above that yellow line, you, you, you're less able to think well. And 
you know, lots of teachers in lots of classrooms looking at the kids in the corner and thinking, oh, you know what, we got a naughty bunch of kids there for a, for the year. Or they never think the kids are the product of the room, you know. So the research was very clear. So the kids in, um, in Dubai, you know, led by a great head teacher, by the way, Asha Alexandra, who's fab, um, you know, they did this work. And what we did was, the only thing that happened was we put in plant walls. So plant walls, say we, they put in plant walls, which was one of the strategies we'd adopted. And one plant per kid uh, is enough plants to suck out the CO2 and replenish it with oxygen. You can see, I mean, you don't need to see the detail. Green is after, blue is before academic progress. Orange is after, blue is before academic progress. But I think you can just about read this sort of, sorry, this sort of teacher-led, um, more subjective index they did for each child. And you can see just significantly less fidgeting, better attention. Children who were still engaged coming up to lunch where before they hadn't been. Now, kids love absolutely love to share these details around the world with each other. The sort of, what have you tried? Can we try it? Oh, that's a good idea. I mean, sometimes the ideas are crazy. You know, there's Japan, his kids playing in a net above the classroom. And I trust cheapers. I'm just, I can't believe I'd ever get that through health and safety anywhere. You know, here's, um, you know, here's a library in, in, uh, in Taiwan, in TK Park, in, in, um, in, in Thailand, beg your pardon, in Bangkok, you know, with, You've got a climber. So not all the ideas are necessarily good ideas, but we're sharing them and we're sharing them about, you know, here's... Um, so how can, if I'm a teacher in a school, how can I convince my leadership um, department or the leadership of my school to to take the kids down this this road? How can I, what what advice well, do you have for me to do that? So you always, you always... Um, go for a research project. You don't say, I'm about to build a revolution here. Uh, you know, you say, I want to try something. And, um, you know, you might try, uh, uh, well, let, let's, let's take this one, for example. So we know that, I mean, the research is very clear that movement is good for your brain. Um, you know, here's a, here's a set of MRI scans of brains. This is, a, this is an aggregate of 20 brains. This is an aggregate of 20 brains. Illinois University work and the um, the kids are doing a standardized test. This group of kids came in and did what we usually tell them to do in schools, which is sit down, collect your thoughts, take a moment, do the test. This lot came in and uh, and um, we said, keep moving, keep running around. And, uh, and, and then they told them to keep on moving till the test started and then sit down. You can see the brain activity difference. The kids who were moving have got more alert brains. I mean, just look at the picture. So when you say that to kids, kids start saying, well, how can we move around? And one way to move around is to, you know, it's to not right on the desk, but right on the walls, right on the windows. Um, this is one of my Madrid classrooms, you know, in the university where the entire building is a writing surface. Is um, is Eton, you know, poshest school in England, where they're right, they're still wearing stupid clothes, you know, but they're writing on the wall. So kids look at other schools and say, what have you tried? What's working? Where's your evidence? So we're not interested in opinions here. And okay, that's that's worth a try. Let's try it in our let's try it in our place. Let's see what happens when we invoke movement. This was um this was an interesting um, school, and uh, you know this is somebody else's um, introduction thing. But the kids themselves are very interesting because this is a coasting school. You know, where results were not all that great, to be honest. It's on the coast, it's just down the road from where I live, for one. So it was really nice to be working in a school nearby, you know. And, and um, Susie, the head teacher, who's inspirational. And the reason, by the way, I'm looking sideways, I've got two screens here. So I'm sort of queuing things up on that screen. And I'm not being disturbed by the chickens suddenly appearing. Or anything, you know? <laughs> but the, um, the kids in that classroom were. Um, were very interesting because I went to see them in May. Our, our academic year ends in, in um, August and uh, August, of course. So I went to see them in May and said to them, um, uh, let's measure the room. Let's see what's going on here. But before we start, who are the kids in this room who are 
you know, kicking off and struggling a bit, coming up to lunch. And they all pointed, and the, the, and the boys in the corner were, oh, God, it's us, you know. Um, and then they said, who are the kids who, this primary school, who are the kids at the end of the day, who just say, hang on, you know, I'm just going to finish this when the mums come to collect you, you know, they're still going. And they all pointed over there. And it was a more mixed group, more girls than boys was a mixed group. So then we measured the room. Of course, the kids in the can't concentrate corner, it was too hot, too dark. CO2 was through the roof, the lot over there. The window is cracked actually, so there's fresh air pouring in to that corner. They're by the window, they had fresh air, everything was good. And the kids could see from the data why they were behaving the way they were behaving. So then we said, okay, let's just make the whole room over. Let's just let's throw all the resources we've got at that room and see how good it can be, you know. And and uh, you know, here they are. This is the you can see the roof went up, the lights went on. We didn't spend a lot of money. But when the when the teacher from the previous year came in to see those kids, and you know, everybody had been a bit cynical, or oh, is this gonna work? You know, lucky it doesn't cost much money, you know. She said, and I quote, if the names weren't the same on the register, I would not believe they were the same kids. So now that school, of course, is now thinking, how can we do this across the school? So, you know, use evidence, use research, use the kids as your co-researchers. And then when you've got the improvement sitting on the table, and it's always there, then you say, okay, how can we do more of this? So don't say, let's change the whole school. Let's take all the lights out, take a classroom, make a difference, see what happens. And here's where it gets a little bit scary because um, I was working with a group of kids in Scotland and we were talking about COVID and what had worked and what hadn't worked in, in COVID terms. And I'm um, just, this was just the other day. So I'm not entirely sure where I put the, um, their conclusions. Well, it kind of doesn't matter. I'll show them to you. So I said to the kids, hold your hands up. Um, how many days a week do you come into school normally? And they said, you know, five, of course. So I said, how many days do you need to come in now, having done home learning, to still feel part of the community? You know, to feel that you belong when you come in, they're your friends. You know, one of the nice things here, the schools have only just gone back um, here after a while, you know, the, it was lovely to see the kids all saying hello to each other. It's just as lovely to see the kids coming out and their parents saying, oh, I've really missed you. Hello, you know, so it was kind of as a, there was a real change going on there, you know. So we said to the kids, how many, hold your hand up, how many days per week do you need to come in to still feel part of the community, but to actually be getting on with your learning? And the average answer was that. The average answer was that. And that meant plenty said that, some said that, nobody said that. So not one kid thought, you know, I'll tell you what, I need to, I need to be in there every day. Um, you know, they're getting an awful lot from, you know, zooming to each other, swapping, doing things, sharing things, moving forward. And what we found interestingly, of course, and heads will have found the same, is kids given control of the pace and direction of their learning have gone for depth every single time. You know, my, um, my granddaughter here, I live with my grandchildren and here's my granddaughter. Uh, there she is. This, this was her experience of, um, of lockdown life. You know, she, she kind of went sailing almost every day and she's been doing qualifications. She's now, uh, she's achieved her level three, you know, which no other child in East Anglia had achieved previously at seven, she's only seven. And, you know, she poured herself, she poured herself into space. You can see on the, just on the ceiling behind me, you can see there's a space rocket hanging from the ceiling. You know, she was building chemical rockets and looking at the conversations of the people in the space center. And, you know, her detailed knowledge of the solar system is now considerable. The primary curriculum, she would have, she would have at this stage been able to name the planets in the right order, but no more, but she knows more about Saturn than ever I do got telescopes she's looking up there and i was talking to a parent the other day yeah i'll just say this please now i talked yeah. to a parent the other day 
who said her kid had done none of the schoolwork that was sent home at all. And uh, he's 13. On the other hand, he just replumbed the bathroom. He's now replumbing the neighbor's house. You know, so kids, mm. kids have gone for depth and they've followed their noses. So when we've talked in the past about stage and not age, you know, in schools like Linfield Learning Village that are fabulous, have embraced it in Australia. Kids went for stage and not age, every single kid, every single home and in different directions. Sorry, you were going to say please. Yeah, no, so we've, because we've got about 15 minutes to go and I was going to just say, we've got some really good suggestions coming through. One, one has been, you know, how would we, we've got these children now who've had this experience for the last three months and longer of self-learning, if you like, and, and really exploring education as we've never been able to explore, nor not in recent years. Uh, how would we advise, you know, how do you give a teacher the advice, for example, of how they engage leadership to take on, for example, the curriculum we're focused on is digital technologies. How do we build a brand new technologies curriculum, four or five years old in Australia? How do we engage leadership to say, look, this is something we, we, we've heard, you know, we see these wonderful things you're talking about and we know they exist in our schools, but they don't often get shared widely unless someone like yourself shares them. But how do we get leadership as general to say, look, this is important and how, and how do we get out, as teachers we want them to engage, as children, we want them to engage, but how do we get leaders to see that it's important? Well, I think as, as always, you know, by asking them rather than telling them, I've probably the history of those um, 75 year leaps that's <coughs> gone from, from doing learning to the children, which was the Sunday school stuff through co-construction. And um, I'll come back to that in a minute, but now to learn a lead, you know, so saying mm. to the kids, what, what have you, you know, it's a simple question, isn't it? What, what are you going to regret losing um, as you come back into schools from your home learning? Uh, and a lot of the rhetoric of politicians, yours are as bad as ours, you know, a lot of that rhetoric has been about catching up. You know, children must catch up all the time they've left. Well, you know, you've seen the research from Christchurch, you know, they were locked down for two terms after the earthquake and the, the results got better, you know, so you know, children became more engaged, became more intellectually mm. committed. So ask them, you know, I mean, for example, say, hey, I've heard that TikTok's doing a lot of online stuff. There's a lot of education. They've just thrown $15 million at, what, what the hell's TikTok? Can you show us, you know, can you, can you run a workshop? Let's explore all that together, you know, give them, give them the lead in those questions. You know, it's, I mean, a lot of most people's experience of Zoom as adults is, is your microphone on? Is she there? Oh, we haven't got her. She's in the wrong room, you know. Well, if you do this with a bunch of kids, and the first thing they do is, you know, you've, you've seen the pass a banana thing where you everybody turns up with a banana and you pass it to the person in the next booth. And you, oh, thanks very much. It's a banana. And you, I mean, you can have a lot of fun with with um, with Zoom. We're moving stuff around. And kids, I was I was talking to a group of kids. I'm doing a lot of talking to kids at the moment. Happy to talk to some of yours for sure, but. Um, we were all chatting and somebody had a virtual background on and suddenly she appears in her own virtual background brings herself a cup of coffee and she oh thanks very much coffee's put down on the table and she leaves so this is a kid bringing her own coffee to herself about 20 minutes into a zoom call of course she'd set a virtual background of her own background with her bringing the coffee in as a as a, an animated gif you know it was just cute as pie and I've never never seen an adult do that but kids are all over this stuff all the time so you know engaging them in the question of what's this going to look like and I'll tell you why it matters for schools because just go back to those five days you only need to be in two days well let's imagine let's let's be generous let's imagine it's two and a half days if it's two and a half days we've got twice as many schools as we need I'll just say that one more time. If it's two and a half days, we've got twice as many schools as we need. Not twice as many teachers. We still need the same number of teachers, same number of leaders, but we ain't going to need that many schools. And have a look at what's happened to retail. If you think, oh, that's a long way off. Uh, you know, I can remember the David Joneses and the, you know, the, the big department stores saying, well, we are the perfect department store. You know, we've, everything's right. The perfume counter is in the right place. The, you know, we, the, men, the men's socks are upstairs. We know where the electric... We have the perfect department store. They were perfect, but nobody wants to go. And, 
and they're all shop. I've not. I've been into one shop, one shop, since March, and uh, you know I'm doing all my shopping online. It's just entirely fine. And I worked with Tesco, the supermarket chain, twenty years ago on the beginning of all that, and they laughed at me when I told them how big it was going to be. But I had a bet on with them, and I've won the bet already. You know, so you can, you can you retire. Know. So say again. You have, if you had money on it, you could have retired. Ah, yeah. Well, if, yeah. <laughs> If I'd had so, money, I would have bought. Yeah. I would have bought Apple shares, wouldn't they? You know, I mean, <laughs> or Tesla, or whatever. You know. I mean, I'm a, Even I'm we've only got. We're never going to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, uh, we've only got five minutes left to go, and I thought we might um, open the floor to anybody who would like to ask a question to you, if that's okay. Um, so, if you would like to ask a question of Stephen, you're, we're happy for you, and you're happy to turn your camera on. You may um, do that and and um, unmute yourself and ask. Um, a question. Just remember that we are still recording, so you will be on um, on the recording if you have your camera on. Meredith. Hi, Stephen. Um, I'm the New South Wales Project Officer for CESA, uh, but I also work in a school and um, I work in an outdoor learning school. It's like, I suppose you would call them a forest school. But um, it's a, a nature school. Um, so I've been thinking about what you've been talking about a lot as well. And I, I've got one child in my family that loved school, loved lockdown, and the other one hated it. And I think the reason the one that hated it was because school offers more than just learning. Mm -hmm. So he missed his sport, he missed his friends, he missed his extracurricular activities. And I'm wondering, do you think schools if you were to do what you were to say and have home days where kids could actually be at home, if schools actually then offer something different for the students. So for example, my school, one day a fortnight, we have outside all day. And this last week I was in the bush all day. In two weeks we're at the beach all day um, doing maths and English and science outside. Um, so I'm just sort of wondering what you think about that. Does schools? Well, it's a, I mean, it's a it's a perfect question, really, because um, as, you know, I'm apart from anything else. My my daughter runs a beach school, beachschool.org, um, which is like forest school but on the beach, and they, but it's very science focused. So they do a huge amount of marine science, and she set it up for preschool kids. So she set it up for four and five year olds, and there's a mass of good resources on there, by the way, if you're near the coast, but. There's an interesting little story which involves these little jellyfish here. And um, so they're in a glass. You can imagine a glass like this. They're a glass like this. They're in the bottom of the glass. So these are pretty small jellyfish. And we don't have the deadly jellyfish you've got. So when the kids discovered these in, uh, in England, they contacted a group of marine biologists because they couldn't work out what they were. Usually they've got their little digital microscopes and their buckets and their magnifying glasses and their nets you know and they're and their wellington boots and they're all out all over the mud flats finding things you know and um and the the minute they they said we found these and talked to a group of marine biologists in a university the marine biologists literally got in a minibus and drove straight to here because these are not supposed to be here they just don't exist in england and uh, when they when they got there they couldn't find them so we had to go and get some of the kids back and the kids said oh well no, they like to hide in the weeds. You won't find them in open well, Here they are, you know. So you had this wonderful moment where children doing science were working with university level scientists, but also the community interest was vast. And we've now, well, by the way, we found that they were coming in in the, um, in the um, ballast tanks of ships coming into the harbour. And then they were pumping out the ballast water and they were they don't, these things don't do very well in salt water, but they were washing into the boating lake in the middle of town. And that was half rainwater and half salt water. It was a perfect environment for them. But they, the kids have now got a relationship with those marine biologists because the kids are on the beach every day and really know about the flora and fauna and the detail of the world that they're living in. And I think, you know, historically, the mistake we've made has been to, to distance education from the community and that's been a little bit fatal. There's a lot of conversation in the media at the moment about um, about um, uh, black history. You know, why aren't we doing more on 
more on black history and I, I was vaguely looking to see if I've got that here probably not but um I did a project in the hang on I might even be able to find it yeah here we go um so after the 1944 education act teachers and schools set their own curriculum and of course the curriculum was based very much in the local community the local forest the flora the fauna in this case in an urban setting and this was me in east london and a lot of the people that we were teaching in east london had, had come over to britain on the windrush boat coming over from the caribbean you know and we we wrote a curriculum together this was a local families and myself wrote a black studies exam and it was fabulous you know and we celebrated it in the community you know the kids presented what they'd done in the library in the the town hall and it was all moderated and they got a proper qualification somewhere between then and now that the curriculum has been pulled into the center and made sort of somehow not directly relevant to the place where the kids are living and of course we've seen with a huge growth in forest schools and kids learning out of doors we've seen that relevance come back and this is why it's important because when you look around the world look at those kids you know, sitting on the floor in Pakistan waiting for somebody to build them a school. They don't need that. What they need is somebody to focus them on the science of the curriculum of their flora and fauna and the plants around them and the skills and languages and culture that they need around them. I was interesting, Pete opened with a, you know, a, a reflection on the, um, the people who've used your, your land before you. And I've, I've learned heaps working with indigenous folk, but it kind of the indigenous um, introduction needs a sort of cyber bit now, doesn't it? Because it's, it's really, really good that indigenous culture has this sense of timelessness and history and connectedness through roots and animals. But that, in a way, that's kind of been written out of the introduction yeah. because we're introducing them to traditional education. And, you know, we're I just, we're at that fork in the road where coming out of the building and spilling out onto the street and perhaps the thing to leave you with is most companies in most of the companies in australia um are you know they have people doing what we're doing zooming a bit or they're on teams or whatever and sometimes they meet in the office but it's modeless you know they don't have an online team and a face-to-face -face team. It's modeless. And I think I don't see anywhere yet the modeless school that says, you know what, if you really like school, come on in. Uh, you know, if you're enjoying the, the footy club. But actually, if the sport you're into is hockey, we don't do hockey, so you might want to do your sport somewhere else. And, and you know, if you want to come in two days a week, help yourself. If you want to come in five days a week, if you want, if your parents want to go abroad for a year, that's fine. It's entirely modeless. You'll still be doing the same projects with the same group of children. It's project-based learning, of course. It's collaborative. It'll be mixed age. It'll be multimodal. It'll be asynchronous. You know, we know all this. So that is what your schools are going to look like. Well, Probably within five yeah. years, certainly not 10. And, that, and that, the leaders, the leaders having that sense of where are we going you know, we're going towards a model of learning that's wider, more global, that's deeper because the kids want that depth above all else. They don't want you to say you can't do this ne this year, wait till next year. That starts earlier, you know, that trust children to be scientists at three and four. And that's bigger because the people who are in learning will be the community, you know, where are we doing teacher training for parents. I mean, all those parents who are looking after their children at home, we sure as hell should have done more in helping them to understand how phonics works or how we do maths these days or how we're using ICT to build coding, you know. So Same. learning is getting bigger, wider, deeper. And that could not be a more exciting team to be a leader, but you can't lead all that by sitting at the top. You've got to lead all that by being in the middle and having a very clear vision that learning might be even better. And that's where Stephen, we are. Uh, that's fantastic, Stephen. That, that, look, it's such a good good place to bring it. Oh, look, if I, we'll, we'll, come, we'll draw this to close. I'll just bring the slides up and share them. But I just want to, first of all, thank you, Stephen. I mean, this is a 
what is the time for you now? It's um, so far. It's four oh five or four oh eight in the morning, same for you, isn't it? Something goes six yeah. six. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so I'll just I'll just bring up these slides and share these. Look, I hope I hope you've taken out of this conversation with Stephen, particularly the the mass massive background around education that he has to share, and we could listen, of course. For, for much longer than we have, unfortunately. And Stephen's probably going to go back to bed now. Uh, <laughs> but look, look to, to wrap this up and, to, and once again to thank Stephen, particularly for being up so early today to do this with us, is what a wonderful teaching community we have of networked teachers who we can come together like this at all hours and in different parts of the world. We could never do this 30, well, we could 30 years ago, but very piecemeal. This is so easy for us to do, and yet we don't take advantage of the opportunities as much as we might. Look, there are, once again, just to remind everybody, uh, those of you who are here already know, of course, about the massive open online courses that have been run through the university and the new security and awareness MOOCs, along with the Teaching AI one, and that the resources some of which we'll put up of Stephen's work, including this video that we've had a webinar today with Stephen. They'll go into the resources section of the Caesar Moot page. Um, and I, I'm sure the links you'll find if you go to the Caesar Moot under resources. And to really a very big thank you to, to those of you who are, were here today. Lovely to see Mary, and I'm sure Mary and Stephen will be able to wave to each other remotely across the world. Uh, <laughs> Um, and the work that Stephen's been doing. Stephen, we know you're going to come back to Australia. It may not be as soon as we'd like you to come back, but from all of us, really, thank you so, so much. And we do have a little bit of a feedback form that if we just put the link up, I think Celia might be able to do that, and then we'll close off. If you get a chance, not necessarily now, but to just click on the link and just give a bit of feedback, it helps us to know how you found the session or these sessions and how we might have either improve or extend them into the future. And Sylvia and Tony, is there anything else that I might have missed at this particular point that you'd like to cover? Uh, if you move on to the next slide, there should be some upcoming webinars. Okay, sure. So these are the webinars to come. We've just published a few more today. So there's more in our webinar series coming up in the next few, next month or so. That was all, Pete. Can I, can I just right. kind of leave you vaguely with a sort of moral imperative in all this, which is, you guys have been pretty lucky in Australia, you know. Um, I know it feels tough if you're in um, South Australia, you've been locked down, Victoria, just down to sort of zero um, cases, I think, today or yesterday, you know. But compared to India or compared to the Philippines or compared to, you know, you're, you're wealthy and you're stable, you know, you're not in northern Nigeria. You know, if you build a, a school, nobody's going to come through the door and shoot all the kids and rape all the teachers you know so you're lucky and you're wealthy and I, and I just think that at the moment the bit of the world that's going fastest is the opposite end to you it's the people who've got nothing to lose and they're saying we've got no legacy systems let's really go for it and I think historically what you did and perhaps what we did in Europe was to use our wealth and stability to build the best version of what we already had you know the the side that sports teams would be led by uh, an Olympian, you know, rather than just somebody's uncle, you know. And, and um, But I think what we have to see now is that with our wealth and opportunity and stability, we need to run ahead of the pack and see how good learning can be so we can pass it on down cheaper to everybody else. You know, tomorrow's learning is not a shiny version of yesterday's learning with a few um, Chromebooks, you know, tomorrow's learning is very different. And I think it's our moral duty to show how good that can be. And, you know, 2.2 billion kids, 1.1 billion kids are depending on us for that leadership. So really, really important time. The most fun you're gonna have in your career, the next 10 years can be fantastic, but hang on to why it matters. It matters because the world's problems need every kid in the world to be as good as they can possibly be to solve those problems. We need all hands on deck, every kid, the smartest they can possibly be. And that is a whole new challenge we've never had before. So, you know, serious thing to think about at the end, but thanks, uh, that's where that's, we are. Thanks so much, Stephen. That's such a wonderful way to finish this, this um, lovely podcast we've had, or broadcast we've had with you today. And I hope 
the rest of you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much. Um, we can let you get back to having a coffee. And uh, thanks, Celia and Tony, for setting all this up for us as well, which has been lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um,